Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. Of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. For our guests here in-house, we would ask that courtesy to see that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off as we begin. And of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage following today's presentations for everyone's future reference. And of course, our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments to speaker at heritage.org to participate online. Leading our discussion is Elizabeth Slattery, who is our legal fellow and appellate advocacy program manager in the Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Her work focuses on the Supreme Court, separation of powers, judicial nominations, and a variety of constitutional issues. She also manages Heritage's moot court sessions to prepare litigators for oral argument in cases pending before the Supreme Court. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Slattery. Are you secretly a racist? Do you harbor prejudices deep within your subconscious? Could you be bigoted without even knowing it? The answer is probably, according to a team of social psychologists who developed a test claiming to uncover unconscious biases. Known as the implicit association test, it measures bias based on how quickly test takers respond to images and words that flash before them on a computer screen. While this test has been hailed as proof of deep-seated racism in American society, before policymakers search for solutions, they should consider the growing body of research, including a new heritage report, that suggests the test cannot predict real-world behavior. You can join the millions of people who have measured their bias and take the test online. In fact, there are implicit association tests measuring several types of bias today, based on race, sexuality, weight, and religion, among many others. In preparing for today's event, I decided to take the race implicit association test. I took it twice, and I got conflicting results. One time, it concluded that I have a slight preference for black people, and another time, it, I got the opposite result with a slight preference for white people. So according to this scientific test, my bias depends on whether or not I've had my afternoon coffee. <laughs> my casual foray into the world of unconscious bias highlights the imprecise nature of this test. And in fact, one of its original proponents has admitted that there's a substantial risk of both falsely identifying people as eventual discriminators and failing to identify people who will discriminate. But warnings like this haven't stopped the media, the academy, and corporate America from jumping on the unconscious bias train. The legal community is following suit. The American Bar Association now offers elimination of bias credits for some of its continuing legal education courses. And there have even been some employment discrimination lawsuits based on claims of unconscious bias. But before it becomes further ingrained in law enforcement, banking, and many other industries, there needs to be a discussion about the broader social and political implications of the implicit association test. To kick off this conversation, we're fortunate to have with us today three experts who have studied race relations in America, and they all have concerns about the implicit association test and unconscious bias. In order to get to our panelists, I will keep their introductions brief. Althea Nagai is a research fellow at the Center for e Equal Opportunity and a statistical consultant here in Washington, DC. She work has worked on numerous statistical studies in social policy, including racial and ethnic preferences in higher education, and the political and social attitudes of American elites, among many others. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Hawaii and her PhD from the University of Chicago. Althea is the author of this new heritage report that's hot off the presses. It's Why Claims of uh, Unconscious Racism Fall Flat. You can pick up a copy outside the auditorium if you did not get one on your way in. Then we'll hear from Heather McDonald. She is the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of City Journal. Her work covers a range of topics, including immigration, policing, homelessness, and race relations. Her latest book, The War on Cops, discusses how race-based attacks on the criminal justice system erode the authority of law and put lives at, risks, at risk. <clears throat> she received a BA from Yale, a master's from Cambridge, and a JD from Stanford Law School. And then finally, we'll hear from Roger Clegg, who is the president and general counsel of the Center for Equal Opportunity, where he focuses on legal issues arising from civil rights laws. He served in several posts in the Justice Department during the Bush and Reagan administrations, including as Deputy Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Division. Roger is a graduate of Rice University and Yale Law School. So with that, I'm going to turn it over first to Althea. 
Okay. <clears throat> First, I'd like to thank Heritage, and I'd like to thank the Center for Equal Opportunity, and especially to Elizabeth for all her work on getting pulling together this forum and the report. Um, this is a technical evaluation of the implicit association test, or it's often called the IAT. Um, despite media coverage on worse worsening race relations. There actually has been an overall decline in overt prejudice and discrimination in the American public, especially since the 1980s. We're talking about an increased approval of intermarriage. We're talking about integrated neighborhoods and schools. And it's common to see prominent African Americans in politics, law, media, medicine, science. In fact, many are now commonly seen on television. But black-white disparities remain, especially in the area of academic achievement, income, wealth, jobs, housing. Um, there's a black-white difference, worse for in crime and drug use. And if there's a decline in overt prejudice, the question became, how do you explain the how do you explain the disparities? Well, the social psychologists have decided that it's unconscious racism. Unconscious racism is still prevalent, and the way they get to this is they devised a test called the Implicit Association Test, the IAT. It's a reaction time test. Okay, it's done on the computer, to, and you respond to pictures and words flashing on a screen. The test taker is said, okay, first you hit the positive key when you see a, see a white face, and then you hit a negative key when you see a black face, and then after you do several rounds of things, then the original test, you know, they flip it where you now said, okay, if you see a black face, hit the positive key, see a white face, hit the negative key. Okay. There's a millisecond difference in response time. The difference in this response time is how they evaluate your degree of unconscious racism. The test was developed in the late 1990s, <clears throat> and later <clears throat> the psychologists, um, Greenwald and Minad Banaji, have written a popular book called Blind Spot. Okay, in this book, came out in 2013, I believe, they claim that three out of four Americans suffer from unconscious racism. It's gotten the race IAT coverage has gotten lots of media play in the Post, in the New York Times, CNN, PBS, they've done documentaries on it, but the scientific critics are many, and the IAT is far from settled science. The academics critics come from lots of different disciplines, psychology, law, sociology, political science, to name a few. Now, what's the most common criticism of the IAT? The IAT has shown to be not reliable. When I say reli reliability, when we talk about reliability in the social science sense, that means consistency of a measure. In other words, your thermometer, you take a temperature now, you take it 10 minutes later, you take it you know, half an hour later, you should pretty much get the same temperature. There's some variation because we know no measuring instrument is perfect. Some measures are better than others, okay? Establishing a measure in the social sciences is, always has way more uh, variability. So it's a lot, more, lot less reliable than a measure in the physical sciences. So conventionally, um, reliability measures are kind of established from a, a range from zero. It's use a, we use a correlation coefficient, and we go from zero to, which is no correlation, to 1.0, which is a perfect correlation. The conventional wisdom is the test retest correlation of any test should be over 0.7 when it's a high stakes test like the SAT, it should be 0.9. Now these are ideals. Okay, what is the IAT's reliability? I have seen it quoted as low as 0.5. That's not very good. And it's, it's a high stakes test. One re group of researchers found that an IAT test plus three retests taken over a two week period results in a correlation coefficient that plummets from about 0.5 to about 0.27. So 
we have an unreliable test here. The IAT also raises questions about validity. Exactly what is this test measuring? What does the term mean? Does it, are they talking about prejudice? Are they talking about unconscious um, stereotyping? Um, some critics say, you know, when you have to attach positive and negative to blackface and whiteface, um, you're engaging in cultural stereotyping or knowledge of the stereo cultural stereotypes. It does not necessarily link to deep-seated prejudice. Um, other critics have said, um, because white faces for most Americans are more common, that what you're tapping into is familiarity versus unfamiliarity, and nothing more than that. My own um, inclination is to think that it also taps into a lot of anxiety, because you know it's a race test. And you know when you take a race test, it makes you even deep-seated, very anxious, because you don't want to know what the score is going to be. So um, when I took the test, I hit the wrong key, and I bailed out on it, because it made me really anxious. Um, so you could, it, it taps into a fear, it taps into anxiety, and the ideal test Really, when you're talking about social sciences, you should not know what the purpose of the test is. But in this case, it's very obvious. Um, finally, it could, the test could also measure, for a large percentage of the population, cognitive quickness and flexibility. How quick can you switch? You know, into, this is an, an in, a matter of intelligence, not um, racism. And oh, yes, finally. Because the test is how, f how fast you push buttons, um, it's what I call a Nintendo effect, where you know, it could measure just simple manual speed and dexterity. So the faster you know how to click buttons and the faster you know how to do these video games, the better you will do on a test. OK, so given all of this, what have they found when they tried to relate this to other indicators of racist behavior? They found small correlations between IAT scores and microaggressions. They found small correlations between IAT scores and what some have defined as racist survey attitude. Even those that created the IAT concede, oh yeah, they're small, really small correlations, but between the IAT and other racist measures, but they say, well, you know, statistically, some small effects can have large effects, so society, so we have to keep the test. Um, this is typically not how we measure, evaluate things in the sciences. So when you have these small correlations, what we're really talking about are a lot of false positives. And therefore, what this means are false accusations of racism. Every test has a problem of false positives. It's a false alarm. The test doesn't give us a way of really evaluating this. <coughs> estimates of the single score on an IET, estimates of false positives for the IET range from 60 to 90%. Okay. But the other problem, at least to me, is the bigger problem is the false negative. The IAT cannot reliably pick up or validly pick up those who are actual racists. It's like you take a cardio test and they say, oh, you know, your cardio test is fine, and two weeks later you have a heart attack. I mean, this is what a low correlation implies regarding the, the IAT. You may take the test. It may say you're not a conscious racist, unconscious racist, but you may actually harbor racist attitudes. You just know how to take the test. So putting it together, what does it all mean? It's not a robust test. It's a high stakes test. <clears throat> Academics have advocated routinely using it in universities. Um, the American Association of Medical Colleges are encouraging admissions committees to use this so they can screen out and become more sensitized to um, rejecting candidates. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, of course, it's been advocated for use in police training. Um, someone advocated using it to screen jurors. So 
there's a wide range of possibilities here, and they've started to introduce these in lawsuits on, on an employment, an employment law. Um, we don't know whether if you randomly assign admission committee to take the test or not take the test. I mean, do they actually do better admitting more blacks? We don't know. They've never done the follow-up. And these are medical schools. This should be done. Um, the possibilities of use of this test and abuse of this test are, are really many. But many of the corporations and institutions that are advocating this test are basically now saying, oh, if three out of four Americans are racist, then they simply jump right into hiring the outside consultant. They go into re-education, retraining, and with hopes that the disparities decline, or at minimum, by doing this, I think they probably just protect themselves from lawsuits. Thank you. Thank you, Althea. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Mr. Malcolm and Heritage and Elizabeth. This is a great privilege, as it always is, to be at Heritage. Uh, and especially to follow Ms. Nagay and her excellent presentation and report, which comes none too soon. I'm going to reinforce some of the things that she said as far as the uh, uptake in the real world of the IAT and the related concepts, uh, and also get at something that she alluded to in the beginning, which is how do we explain the persistence of, uh, of socioeconomic racial gaps, because that is what gives the whole implicit bias movement uh, its oomph. Uh, so few academic ideas have been as eagerly absorbed into public discourse in recent years as implicit bias. Embraced by a president, a would-be president, and the nation's top law enforcement official, the implicit bias conceit has launched a movement to re remove the concept of individual agency from the law and spawned a multi-million dollar consulting industry. As Altia said, the statistical basis on which it rests is crumbling. Unfortunately, I would not wait for its influence to wane anytime soon. The need to plumb the alleged unconscious to explain ongoing racial gaps arises for one reason. It is taboo in universities and mainstream society to acknowledge intergroup differences in interests, abilities, cultural values, or family structure that might produce socioeconomic disparities. In the recent decade, the implicit bias conceit has spread like wildfire. President Barack Obama, denounced unconscious biases against minorities and females in science in 2016. NBC anchor Lester Holt asked Hillary Clinton during a September 2016 presidential debate whether, quote, police are implicitly biased against black people. Clinton answered, not surprisingly, quote, Lester, I think implicit bias is a problem for everyone, not just the police. Then FBI Director James Comey, perhaps not a big uh, object of, of affection in this room, but I have to say I still hold a, 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 a soft spot in my heart for him thanks to his confirmation of what I've called the Ferguson effect. But he claimed in a 2015 speech that, quote, much research points to the widespread existence of unconscious bias. Quote, many people in our white majority culture, Comey said, react differently to a white face than to a black face. The Obama Justice Department packed off all federal law enforcement agents to implicit bias training, and Clinton promised to help fund local police departments in doing the same for their uh, departments, but many of which already began the whole implicit bias charade following the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson in 2014. A parade of journalists have confessed their IAT revealed preferences, including Malcolm Gladwell, in his acclaimed book, Blink. Corporate diversity trainers have retooled themselves as the new purveyors of the science of bias. And the Legal Academy has started building the case that the concept of intentionality in the law is scientifically obtuse. Federal anti-discrimination law has been fixated on and obsessed with conscious intent, grouse these IAT-inspired law professors.
but the new behavioral realism as the movement to incorporate IAT-inspired concepts into the law calls itself, shows that we, quote, discriminate without the intent and awareness to discriminate. Jerry Kang is UCLA's fantastically remunerated vice chancellor of equity, diversity, and inclusion, pulling in $444,000 a year. He is a leader in this behavioral realist movement. He has said, quote, uh, if we only look for conscious intent, we will necessarily be blind to a whole bunch of real harm that is painful and, un and consequential, end quote. Kang has pitched behavioral realism to law firms, judges, corporations, and government agencies. The alleged new si if the alleged new science of bias becomes legally actionable, then every personnel decision can be challenged as the product of implicit bias. The only way to guarantee equality of opportunity would be to mandate equality of results through quotas. The potential reach of the behavioral realism movement, which George Soros' Open so uh, Society Foundation, not surprisingly, is underwriting, goes far beyond employment discrimination litigation. Some employers, as Althea mentioned, are using the IAT to screen potential workers. More and more college administrations require members of faculty search committees to take the IAT to confront their hidden biases against minorities and female candidates. Promotion committees at many corporations undergo the IAT. UCLA Law School makes all of its first year law students take it in order to reveal their own biases. University of Virginia nearby might incorporate the IAT into its first year curriculum, a total waste of time. Jerry Kang of UCLA has argued for FCC regulation of how the news media portray minorities to lessen implicit prejudice. If threats to fair treatment lie in every mind, as Kang and Maharan Banaji, who was the original uh, creator of the IAT, argued in a, in a law review article, then the scope for government intervention in private transactions to overcome those threats is limitless. Meanwhile, outside the purview of these debates, two salient factors of our world go unnoticed by the participants. First, the pervasiveness of racial preferences, and second, the behavior that, li that lies behind socioeconomic disparities. One would have difficulty finding an elite institution today that does not pressure its managers to hire and promote as many blacks and Hispanics and females as possible. Nearly 90% of Fortune 500 companies have some sort of diversity infrastructure. The Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission requires every business with 100 employees or more to report the racial composition of its workforce. Employers know that empty boxes for blacks and other underrepresented minorities can trigger governmental review. Some companies tie manager compensation to the achievement of, quote, diversity. Walmart and other big corporations require law firms to put minority attorneys on the legal, terms that rep legal teams that represent them. In colleges, the mandate to hire more minority and female candidates hangs over almost every faculty search. Asians, of course, don't count as a minority or person of color for academic diversity purposes because they're academically competitive. Deans have canceled faculty searches in order, and ordered the hiring committee to go back to the uh, drawing board if the finalists are not sufficiently diverse. And do not think that the hard sciences are free of this pall. It's happening in engineering. It's happening into physics. It's happening in chemistry. Every selective college today admits black and Hispanic students with much weaker academic qualifications than white and Asian students, as any high school senior knows. Similar pressures exist in the government and nonprofit sectors. In the New York Police Department, blacks and Hispanics are promoted ahead of whites for every position to which promotion is discretionary, as opposed to being determined by an objective exam. And yet, we are to believe that the alleged millisecond associations between blacks and negative terms are a more powerful determinant 
of who gets admitted, hired, and promoted than these often explicit and heavy-handed preferences. If a competitively qualified black female PhD in computer engineering walks into Google, for example, we are to believe that a recruiter will unconsciously find reasons not to hire her so as to bring on an inferior white male. The scenario is preposterous on its face. In fact, such a candidate would be snapped up in an instant by every tech firm and academic department across the country. The same is true for competitively qualified black lawyers, accountants, and portfolio managers. If such discrimination is so ubiquitous, there should be victims aplenty that the proponents of implicit bias can point to. They cannot. I twice asked Anthony Greenwald, whom Altea mentioned was the other co-creator of the IAT, if he was aware of qualified candidates in any faculty department across the country who were rejected or ignored because of skin color. He twice stuck to my question. I twice asked Jerry Kang's assistant if Chan Vice Chancellor Kang were aware of any faculty candidate anywhere who was competitively qualified who did not get the job because of race of gender. Same silence. PricewaterhouseCoopers has spearheaded an economy-wide diversity initiative dubbed the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion, TM. 200 CEOs have signed a pledge to send their employees to implicit bias training. In the case of PricewaterhouseCoopers, that means packing off 50,000 employees to the trainers. And any organization spending a large sum of money on a problem would presumably have a firm evidentiary basis that the problem exists. I asked a PwC spokesman if she was aware of implicit bias candidates, how implicit bias had worked against candidates who should have been hired at PricewaterhouseCooper but weren't. In a laborious phone exchange, she answered, quote, everyone has unconscious bias. I'm not saying that anyone is not being hired or promoted, but it's part of the workplace and it's the science, end quote. Well, you can read through hundreds of implicit bias studies, and Miss Althea has done so, and they are killers, and never come across the reason for lack of diversity in the workplace, the academic skills gap. Given the gap size, anything resembling proportional representation can only be achieved through massive hiring preferences. From 1996 to 2015, the average difference between the mean black score on the math SAT and the mean white score was 0.92 standard deviations. The racial gaps are particularly great at the tails of the distribution. The usual poverty explanations for the SAT gap don't hold up. In 1997, white students from households with incomes of $10,000 or less scored better than black students with household incomes of $80,000 to $100,000. At the University of California, race predicts SAT scores better than class. Proponents of racial pre of preferences routinely claim that the SATs are culturally biased and do not measure actual cognitive skills. If that were the case, Blacks would do better in college than their SAT scores would predict. In fact, blacks do worse than their SAT scores predict. The math achievement gap will affect hiring most in fields with advanced quantitative requirements. In 2016, 1% of all PhDs in computer science went to blacks, or 17 out of 1,659 PhDs. Yet the biggest Silicon Valley firms are wedded to the idea that their own implicit bias is responsible for the racial and gender composition of their workforce. A member of Google's people analytics, that's one of its cloying terms for human resources department, lectures wild, widely about implicit bias in the IAT. In August 2017, as we all saw, Google CEO fired James Damore, a computer engineer, for daring to question the assumptions behind the company's implicit bias training, especially regarding gender. 
A host of other professions beyond the sciences draw on the analytic skills required by algebra and the math SAT. Business management and consulting, professions, medicine, nursing, all should be able to master basic algebra. These professions should not be tainted with the implicit bias charge when they are hiring from the same finite pool of competitively qualified blacks. The SAT's verbal sections show the same 100-point test score gap between whites and blacks as the math section. The LSAT, it's even worse. It has a greater test score gap. It measures verbal reasoning, comprehension, 1.06. Yet the preferences used by law schools to admit black candidates are so great that the majority of black law students cluster in the bottom 10th of their class. The median black law school GPA is at the sixth percentile of the median white GPA, meaning that 94% of whites do better than the median black. This achievement gap, again, cannot be chalked up to implicit bias on the part of professors because law school exams are graded blind. The results in the bar passage rate is, are just as dire. Now, the iron grip of the implicit bias concept on the corporate world will merely result in a loss of efficiency as workers are again trundled off to this later, latest iteration of diversity training and further pressure to take race into account in personnel decisions. But it's in law enforcement that the mania for implicit bias training exacts its most serious cost. Police officers are desperate for more hands-on tactical training, and clearly they need it. They need help in making those excruciating split-second shoot-don't-shoot decisions. They need help in communication skills. But implicit bias training is a costly and wasteful diversion uh, from their training needs that is being carried out in the name of a fiction, that bias-driven policing is killing black men. Study after study has shown that this is not the case. If there is a bias in police shootings, it works in favor of blacks and against whites. But all the IAT-inspired lecturing cannot change the reality that drives police activity today, the incidence of crime. And that is a topic about which implicit bias trainers have little to say. As I discovered observing a three-day training program in Chesterfield, Missouri, just outside of Ferguson in 2016. A day and a half into the three-day Chesterfield training, the attendees had been informed that Michael Brown, the Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson was a function of implicit bias, that the overrepresentation of blacks in prison was because blacks get longer sentences than whites for the same crime. The attendees had learned about the IAT, of course. They'd watched a video of singer Susan Boyle's victory in the television show Britain's Got Talent. They had viewed photos of a hot babe on a motorcycle, probably it wouldn't be allowed into training these days, and a female executive with a briefcase. They had written down stereotypes about the unhoused, not activities directly related, say, to serving a felon felony warrant safely. The theme of these exercises was that everyone carries around stereotypes and that those stereotypes were killing black men. Now, the trainers tiptoed very gingerly up to the topic of black crime. It is partially factual, said one of the trainers, that people of color are disproportionately involved in street crime. Actually, it's fully factual. Street crime today is almost exclusively the province of, quote, people of color. I'll just give you data from New York City. Blacks and Hispanics commit 98% of all shootings there. Whites, who are at 34% of the population, commit less than 2% of all shootings. Blacks are 23% of the city's population. They commit 71% of New York's gun violence, meaning that a black New Yorker is 50 times more likely to commit a shooting than a white New Yorker. These disparities are the same in every big city, whether it's Chicago or Washington, D.C.
Of course, a police action should not be based on a stereotype. But crime in our data-driven policing era is overwhelmingly the determinant of policing today. And to pretend that implicit bias drives policing distracts officers from the challenges they face. By day two, the audience was interjecting some social and political reality back into the training. Quote, are there any studies about black and white officer shootings? A black officer asked the trainers. No one's outraged if I shoot a black, said this black officer. But if a white officer does, it will be pandemonium. Then an officer from Chesterfield, Missouri itself raised the most pressing concern in the Black Lives Matter era, depolicing. 75% of the shoplifters in the Chesterfield malls were black, even though the black population is just over 2% uh, in Chesterfield. Quote, we struggle with depolicing. It's difficult to tell officers to enforce the shoplifting laws when they will be confronted with the implicit bias issue. That is the dilemma facing officers today. If they enforce the law, they will generate the racially disproportionate stop and arrest statistics that fuel specious implicit bias charges. But it is the reality of crime, not bias, which results in those disproportions. In conclusion, the implicit bias crusade is agenda-driven social science. A thought experiment is in order. If American blacks acted en masse like Asian Americans for 10 years, in all things relevant to economic success, if they had similar rates of school attendance, paying attention in class, doing homework and studying for exams, staying away from crime, persisting in a job, and avoiding out of wedlock child rearing. And we still saw racial differences in income, professional status, and incarceration rights. Then it would be well justified to seek an explanation in unconscious prejudice. But as long as the behavioral disparities remain so great, the minute distinctions of the IAT are a sideshow. America has an appalling history of racism and brutal subjugation. And we should always be vigilant against any recurrence of that history. But the most influential sectors of our economy today practice preferences in favor of blacks. The main obstacles to racial equality lie not in implicit bias, but in culture and behavior. Thank you for your attention. Wow. Um, I think that uh, this panel show so far shows that the, uh, the radical feminists are correct, that uh, men are superfluous. Uh, <laughs> I will just uh, add a few comments to, uh, to what uh, Althea and, and Heather and, and Elizabeth have, have said. Um, is there such a thing as unconscious bias? Sure. Uh, and there's also such a thing as conscious bias. Uh, you know, you'd have to be delusional to think otherwise, but you'd also have to be delusional, as Althea noted, uh, to think that there's a lot less of both now uh, than there was 50 years ago. Um, but you know, this is just the beginning of the discussion. You know, how much unconscious bias is there? How do we measure it? What do we do about it? Uh, and the verdict is in that the implicit association test is not any good. Um, Althea's report makes that uh, crystal clear. It's, uh, it's, it's brilliantly done. But I will, I will add that uh, she is not alone and pointing this out. Uh, if you go to Wikipedia, and who can quarrel with Wikipedia, uh, it will point out that there is a lot of controversy uh, about uh, the veracity of the IAT. The Chronicle of Higher Education and New York Magazine in the last year or two have run long articles pointing out the significant problems with the IAT. Neither the Chronicle of Higher Education nor New York Magazine is part of uh, the vast right wing conspiracy. So, you know, the problems with the implicit association test are, are there. I think that because of those problems, the efforts to get it um, used in courts will continue 
to uh, uh, the founder. Um, uh, there, there's not been great headway in, in, in that regard so far, uh, despite uh, law review articles by left-wing uh, professors who wish that the IAT were used in more courts. But I believe that um, uh, Heather is correct that we should not expect to see a diminution in the citation and reliance on the, on the IAT, unfortunately, because it just fits in too well with the left-wing narrative. Uh, it's too handy a device, uh, it's too handy an excuse uh, to advance the left-wing's uh, agenda, which is uh, racial quotas. The, um, the position of the left seems to be that you can't use subjective criteria uh, because of unconscious bias, but you also can't use objective criteria either uh, because of disparate impact. Uh, as a consequence, you know, what are people supposed to do? Uh, well, you know, the answer is you're supposed to hire by the numbers. And that is itself discrimination and, and should not be done. Let me give, you know, a concrete example of, of the problems that you run into in this area. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, in an opinion that she wrote uh, that, that, that talked about uh, unconscious bias, uh, pointed out that uh, in order to combat the problem of bias against female musicians, the uh, orchestra started to uh, interview with a, an opaque screen between the people who were judging the applicants for uh, musician positions in orchestras uh, and the, the person who was auditioning. And sure enough, when that happened, uh, you saw a rise in the number of, of uh, women who were hired uh, to be musicians. I think that's great. I think it would be terrific if decision makers in colleges and universities and, and, uh, and, and corporate America took all indicators of race and ethnicity and sex off of resumes. Now, do you think that the left would be happy with that? No. They would be horrified. They are perfectly happy to have race and ethnicity and sex weighed in hiring decisions as long as they are weighed in a politically correct way. The, if you want to get rid of racism, the last thing you want to do is to create artificially environments where you are selecting less qualified uh, African Americans, for example, and mixing them in with people of other races who are much better qualified than they are. That is not going to tear down stereotyping. It's going to foster it and increase it. Uh, and of course, it's also going to end up uh, hurting the African Americans who are hired and are put in situations where their academic credentials and their qualifications are lower than everyone else's. It would be much better off for everyone if people went to schools and jobs for which they were academically qualified, regardless of race or ethnicity. That, unfortunately, is not something that uh, is, is likely to make the left very happy. And of course, if you are serious about hiring the best qualified people, you have to accept the fact that from time to time there are going to be uh, disproportionate impacts on this or that group because there is literally no selection device that is not going to have a disparate impact on somebody. There's going to be some racial or ethnic uh, or, or gender or religion or marital or you know, age or whatever you like group uh, that is not going to be precisely, proportionately represented uh, in any test that you administer. Let me you know, end with the point that um, I think both, both uh, Heather and 
Althea uh, alluded to, and I'm, I'm just going to, to, under, to underline it uh, a bit more heavily. There are racial disparities in this country, um, but the racial disparities that we see in education and crime and poverty and, and, and so forth uh, are less and less the result of racism. They are, in fact, a, I think, you know, the most significant cause of those disparities is the, uh, is the disparity in the out of wedlock birth rate. In the United States, uh, approximately seven out of 10 African Americans are born out of wedlock. Seven out of 10. Six out of 10 Native Americans are born out of wedlock. More than five out of 10 Latinos are born out of wedlock versus fewer than three out of 10 non-Hispanic whites and fewer than two out of 10 Asian Americans. Now that is a huge range, all the way from fewer than two out of 10 to seven out of 10. And if you look at those disparities, it's no coincidence that they line up very well with how well the different groups are doing. Children do better when they are raised in uh, a home that has two families, or that has two, two parents. Anybody who's been a parent knows that it's a tough job. Uh, it's a tough job with two parents. Uh, it's much more difficult with one parent. And it should be no surprise that you see these disparities uh, in crime, in how well people do uh, educationally. Uh, you, know, you name the, the social measure, and children do better uh, if they are brought up in, in, a, in a home with two parents. And that's, that's the takeaway, I think, from, from all of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. So now we'll, we have time for a few questions from the audience. So if you'll wait for the microphone um, and please identify yourself. We'll start here. Oh, Milton Grenfell. Um, whether or not the tests are, are accurate or not seems to me it's not as big of a problem as the fact that they are testing thoughts. I mean, how did this Orwellian notion of thought policing ever take root? I mean, I suspect in any of our minds, if you're, you could tap into our subconscious, you walk down the street, one minute you might be a rapist, one minute you might be a murderer, one minute you might be a thief. I mean, you know, these thoughts go through us. We don't act on them, so, so we're not that way. I mean, aren't we, shouldn't we back up and say just get rid of testing subconscious and let's just, you know, judge on behavior? Take that. Well, you know, I, uh, I I think that's a very good point, and I this is one. Of, if you go through the the problems with the IAT, one thing that we did not talk about, uh, uh, Althea talked about this a little bit, but maybe we could have talked about it more, is that even if you do um, have uh, you know some stereotypical notions in your mind. Uh, you know, there's there's a big difference between you know having these stereotypical notions and actually acting on them. And you know, I'm prepared to believe that um, a lot of people, you know, maybe you know, uh, consciously or subconsciously, um, you know, more fearful. You know, uh, 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 if they look around and you know behind them and they see that they're they're being followed on a dark alley by you know two youths who happen to be African Americans. Uh, you know, guess what? Jesse Jackson said <laughs> that he felt that way himself. Um, but there's a big difference between, you know, having feelings like that and acting on them by not giving somebody a job. I and mean, particularly, you know, when the popular culture is telling people uh, racism is bad, uh, when the corporate culture is telling people racism is bad, when you can lose your job, you know, if you are if you are racist, and where it doesn't make economic sense to hire somebody who is uh, not the best qualified for the job, so there's a huge leap between whatever it is, you know, that the IAT measures and actually an actual behavior. Okay. Other questions in the back there? Wouldn't that the kind of uh, use the uh, time and study to see why minority like blacks or others have uh, are not qualified 
and creating, as you uh, claim, uh, more uh, crimes and that kind of stuff than just trying to uh, justify uh, the racial. Another my question is that why do you, in the past century, still the issue of race and issue of black, white minorities is a more important in this country? Why should it be already eliminated? Has anybody studied that? Well, I, I would just, if I understood your question, why do we still see the persistent gaps? And I, I think Roger put his finger on it. It, it is, above all, uh, the, the growing breakdown of the black family uh, that results in the crime rates, the dropping out of school, uh, the lack of socialization, the, the lack of the ability to defer gratification. Uh, so that really, I think, is, is driving these ongoing gaps as far as why it's more here or we're more conscious of it here than elsewhere. Obviously, again, our history is very, very bad. And uh, I, I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the skepticism on the left that we could possibly have turned that around. But history shows there are sea changes in sentiment. And you know, the chestnut that's always invoked is attitudes towards homosexuality and gay marriage. I mean, that is just, in a very brief period of time, a remarkable uh, shift in cultural sentiment in this country. And I would say when it comes to race, uh, that is also the case. I would, I would be even more emphatic uh, than Roger. It, to, to, to even posit that these unconscious biases are at work requires ignoring the explicit preferences that are at stake in virtually every hiring and promotion in elite institutions in the in the private sector and in the public sector. So it just it, it does not hold up. I mean, of course, we have rational stereotypes. I mean, there's there's a guy that is studying stereotypes, and it turns out that most stereotypes are accurate. Of course, we have those stereotypes, but uh, based on behavior. But the culture now is set to completely override them. Yeah, I think we're going to, I'm sorry, we have time for one more question. We'll go here. Let me, let me uh, just, you know, add one. I agree with what, what Heather said. And of course, the presence of, of, of stereotypes and the fact that you can make, you know, I mean, stereotypes are generalizations. And, you know, you certainly can make generalizations based on race and ethnicity and sex and so forth. Um, I think that we should fight against that. I think that we should do uh, our best to judge people as individuals. Uh, you know, the fact that stereotypes exist is, is not a justification for them. But again, um, you know, how do we, how do we fight, you know, stereotypes? Um, you know, the last thing that you want to do uh, if you're serious about fighting stereotypes, is to create situations where uh, the minorities who are being stereotyped against are being set up to fail. You know, where, I mean, you know, if the University of Michigan says, you know, we're a very elite institution, uh, and you've got to be really smart to get in here, unless, of course, you're African American, you know, then our standards are not quite so high. Well, you know, how does that message fight stereotypes? You know, the way that, uh, fight stereotypes in the United States is to uh, uh, invoke our, our motto, our original motto of e pluribus unum. We're all Americans. You know, nobody gets a preference. Nobody gets discriminated against. Nobody gets uh, discriminated in favor because of your skin color or what country your ancestors came from. That's the way that people should be evaluated, you know, as individuals. And the fact that, you know, there, there may be generalizations, you know, should be irrelevant. That's what our laws say. You know, our laws say that, you know, just because, you know, statistically, you may be less likely to have a high school diploma if you're black than if you're white, that doesn't give an employer the right to decide that, well, you know, rather than ask people if they have a high school diploma, we're just going to assume that whites have them and blacks don't. That's, that's not allowed under our civil rights laws, and it shouldn't be. 
you know, we should be fo we should be focused on treating people as individuals. No preference, no discrimination one way or the other. No politically correct discrimination, no politically incorrect discrimination either. Well, with that, we've come to the end of our hour, so please join me in thanking our panelists.